Oh, hello. Um, hope you're doing okay. Please, you can mute. Uh, okay, good. Uh, it's another beautiful time that I want to speak concerning um, something really critical that uh, why you need to test if you're in the faith. And uh, today I would like to give actually my testimony uh, of uh, how I got saved and what really caught in me to understand that uh, probably what I believed was not even salvation. Just like many of us, uh, they believe in something, you put all your heart in something, but you don't really understand. They, they are always questions, question marks. Eh? And you're asking yourself, am I really saved? Uh, am I really going to heaven? And whenever there's something which uh, probably has scared you in some way, you, you get scared and you, and you ask yourself, what is really happening? Am I going to heaven or am I deceived? Or you see, that one happens so much, especially in uh, to most um, church goers. And uh, many of us, we find ourselves in situations which we cannot really explain. Am I, am I saved? You know, if, if you have some doubts in your heart, and uh, you're feeling in your heart that there's they something, am I really saved? There's always a possibility that probably you're not even saved, okay? So I decided today to do a video just to try and talk about salvation, to try and tell and explain, giving myself as a testimony uh, of how I got saved, because uh, I'm one of the people who have been you know, in the church for the longest time. And th this today's uh, Bible study will be a little bit more relaxed. It will not be very in intense like I always do it all the time because I want people to understand and to evaluate their lives and to see where am I standing? Am I somehow lost in some way? Am I really in the faith? Because it's very important to test if you're in the faith. You know, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, he said that, he told us, evaluate yourselves, test if you're in the faith, okay? Just test and see, am I really in this faith? Let, let's, let's just start with that uh, in 2 Corinthians 13.5, before I come to this, 2 Corinthians 13.5, and let's see what Paul told us, 2 Corinthians uh, 13 verse 5. He told us, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, okay? Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now, Paul is telling us to examine ourselves and we see, are we really in the faith? Because you can be so lost in some traditions, you can be so lost in some false doctrine, in something which you're thinking that you're saved, but for sure you're not even saved. And at the end of the day, there's nothing so bad as when Jesus comes back and you've been in the church all your life and you see yourself going to hell. It can be so disastrous. You will feel wasted and, and sold out and you will, you, you will feel betrayed and you'll ask yourself, why did I go to church? Maybe probably churches which did not even tell me the truth. I was lost, you know? So it's very important to examine yourself, just like the way Apostle Paul has told us, that we examine ourselves and we see if we are in the faith. This is very key. It is a key thing. Because when you do that, you'll be able to know where am I standing and what am I doing? Am I on God's side or not? So today I want to give my testimony of salvation. And I want to explain what, how I really got saved and how I got, really got to uh, know the word of God and be saved 100%. I know if Jesus comes today, I'm absolutely 100% sure that I'll go to heaven. You see, before I was uh, not really sure. Or oh, just like uh, so many of us uh, in the churches who are not really sure. If somebody stops you and he tells you, I'm putting a gun here and I want to blow off your mind, your brains. And uh, somebody tells you, I give you one wish. What would you want uh, to do in the last seconds? Is it to call maybe somebody, call your mother, just say, hello, hey guys, I'm leaving. Or will you be so tense and telling this criminal who is about to kill you, please let me repent. Let me repent. I don't want to go to hell. If you're that kind of person, then you have to know that if you're doubting yourself, there's a high possibility the Holy Spirit is telling you that, hey, dude, you're not even saved. 
because the Bible tells us we will know when we are saved and it is absolutely, and there's no way out, okay? So personally, I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church. Uh, just like many people in the Pentecostal church, you know, the Pentecostal church is a church where it's all about you know, signs and wonders and speaking in tongues and a lot of, uh, there's a lot of drama in that church. And uh, there's always some things that you don't really understand and you're always getting confused. Why are people falling down? Uh, why am I not falling like them? Why are people speaking in some weird languages and why am I not speaking like them? I was always asking myself these questions. And I remember when I was young, because uh, I, 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 I was in the Pentecostal church. I am, attended, uh, you know, Sunday schools. I, I, you know, I even became a church worship leader. I was also doing some uh, some sub youth pastoring of, you know, you know, in in most of the Pentecostal churches, they don't they don't really check on you, your background, and hear what you really believe. They just you know, it's a place as long as you, you're just like them and all that. I'm, I'm not after bashing any church, but I'm just after giving you the real truth so that you can evaluate it by yourself. So one thing which really used to uh, make me wonder, I used to see people falling down and they are, uh, they, they are being told remove snakes from, you know, uh, people are being told, hey, this person is walking like a snake. He has a demon of this, a demon of that. And I was used to ask myself, you mean these people are always in the church and every Sunday they are removed, they are being removed from demons. Does it mean that uh, people who are saved are demon possessed or what really happens? So these are some of the things which really, I was just there confused and lost. And I thought, because uh, there is a pastor who came to a church and then he said, all those who want to get saved, come and say the sinner's prayer. I said the sinner's prayer. And I, and I thought probably because of I have said this prayer, I know I am saved. And he told me, did you, did you really believe in that prayer? Did you, were you sincere when you were saying that prayer? And I said, yes, pastor, I was really sincere. And any time that I could feel I'm really far from God, I'm sinning too much, I'm doing so many dirty, dirty, you know, underground stuff. I'm, the, you know, there are always those things that you're doing and you feel I'm, I think I'm far from God this week. I've really done so many evil things. Am I really saved now? Do I tell God to forgive me? Or do I get saved in, in a clean way now again? So all the time, sometimes when I do so many sins, I could go to the pastor and tell him, please, pastor, just uh, pray for me to be saved again. And he tells me, "Did you? were you not really sincere when you were saying that prayer? Did you not really say it in the, you, you see, that's what most of the churches, they tell you. And uh, sometimes maybe when there's a crusade or there's uh, some new preacher and then he preaches so powerfully and stuff like that. And then he says, of course, most of these pastors, they'll preach about Moses and Abraham and what, and then at the end of the day, they will tell you how many want to receive Jesus in their hearts. And then I will always be in the forefront going to receive Jesus into my heart. So I, I think I say the sinner, I said the sinner's prayer over a hundred times. And I really trusted in that prayer. And anytime I could feel scared, I could think and ask myself, have I said the prayer so well? Is there any word that I confused maybe? Did I leave one word out? Did I use the right tone, the right key? Did I say, is there something that I left behind? So I trusted so much on a prayer, just like many people usually trust in a prayer. I thought I was saved because I said the sinner's prayer. So sometimes in your lives, I'm sure you, 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 you're at some point whereby you feel I've really gone far away from God because of maybe I've not been reading the word of God. I've not been doing this. I've not been doing this. And actually that time, it was really difficult for me to even read the Bible. I never used to understand the Bible. I could read the Bible, but I'm just seeing very hard, crazy words, which I cannot really say what these words mean. And it was difficult for me. I remember one time um, I decided I will read the whole Bible from, you know, Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> and you see, when, when I reached, I think about uh, numbers or somewhere there, Deuteronomy numbers, when they started saying, and so-and-so begat who and who and who begat who. I was just confused and I was like, this Bible is so confusing. How do people enjoy reading this book? It was so terrible and so hard for me. 
And I'm sure as I speak, this is also applying. And some of you, you can be able to see what I'm talking about is exactly what is happening probably to, to some of you here who are watching me. You find yourself, you can't really understand how people enjoy reading the Bible all the time. How do people enjoy going to fellowships? How do people enjoy going to church every Sunday? How do people enjoy meeting up and gathering and talking about the Bible? It was so heavy for me. I was always feeling... How do these people enjoy these things? How do you enjoy a Bible study? It's so difficult. It's so difficult. Whenever a pastor was preaching uh, just there in front, I, I was always like asking, what time will you finish? I just want to go home or I just want to sleep. I'm so tired. I, there's nothing which was exciting. Are you seeing the picture? Now, after high school, I started hustling. You know, of course, uh, you've come to the city. I came to Nairobi, I started hustling, doing my businesses here and there, you know, you're just this guy who is just after school, okay? I started hustling and uh, I'm halfway in the church and halfway in the world, you know, the, the nature of most um, uh, lukewarm Christians, you're halfway in the church and halfway in the world. In the sun, uh, on Sundays, you're more of a holy joy. You're wearing your best suit and you say, oh, hallelujah. Oh, pastor. Hey, brother. Hey, you know, I was that kind of person. But during the week, you're as evil as you could ever think. You're drinking, partying, you know, all the bad things, cursing, uh, being corrupt, doing all the things that you could ever think. And uh, it was so mixing me up in my mind. And I was asking myself, why is it that I enjoy doing sin and I still enjoy the things of God, but I'm always confused. And whenever I think about Jesus is coming or the rapture or things like that, I could really get so much uh, fear in my heart. And, and I was praying to God every night. I remember I was very fearful. Eh? Every night I could pray to God and tell him, please, God, if you're coming tonight, if you're coming tonight, make sure you scare me as much as you can so that I can say that prayer again. I want to say that prayer so that in case I had uh, done something wrong within the week or within the day, I can repeat that prayer and then I know I'm forgiven and then I can go to heaven. You see how lukewarm Christians calculate during the week, you're all sinful, corrupt, um, immoral, doing every other bad thing that you can never think about, you know, stealing from people, doing this and that, cursing and and all the things that you could ever think during the week. But over the Sundays, you see, do you see the way people are on Sundays? And they're so holy and they're going to church, but their week does not reflect. You see, salvation is a relationship. It's a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. It's, salvation is not <laughs> some buttons that you go and press. You see, there are those people who think that Jesus is like a, a software. You just go and say a 10 10 Our Fathers, 10 Hail Marys, you just press here and there, and then you say, uh, Our Father, what you never want, uh, Hail Mary, this and that, or you say some prayer, or you say some sinner's prayer. It's, it's like Jesus is like a button. He's like, he's like artificial intelligence. No, it's not like that. Salvation is a relationship. It's a relationship. And I don't want to spill the beans before I come to there. So I used to be in this wide gate, you see, there are these churches whereby we call them the wide gates to hell. And I like to call them wide gate to hell because they never tell you anything concerning salvation. Many of them, they never tell you anything concerning salvation. And I'll, and I'll tell you for sure, most of these churches, especially in the Pentecostal movement, you need to be very careful about that. I'm not saying there are other churches that are better than that, but there's a lot of confusion there. And if you don't, you're not really keen, you'll be among us the confused ones who are not even saved. Of course, there are people who are saved in the Pentecostal church, but many of them are really confused. They are confused because of miracles and wonders and signs and speaking in tongues and rolling out and shouting and others saying, you know, I'm seeing this vision of this vision. You said there's a lot of drama in, in the Pentecostal church. And if you're not careful about that, you'll be confused by the dramas and you'll never get saved even one day. Are you seeing the picture? So I'm not saying there are no people who are saved in Pentecostal. I've been there and uh, I just told God, please, if let, let me just stay away from this because I just need to first understand what salvation is because I never had one day my pastor speaking about what salvation is, what the gospel is. 
They could preach everything else apart from the gospel, apart from how you're saved. I thought salvation is just a sentence you do, so that's why they don't even preach it. I thought salvation is just some sinner's prayer that you say, so why should the pastor be preaching about salvation, about how people are saved, about what you need to do to be saved? I thought it's just a small thing. And uh, most of these mega churches that, that we used to go, of course, uh, many people who know me, they know the places that I've been worshiping at. I've been at these many, 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 many churches. And these, some of these churches are the wide gates to hell. They are the wide gates that the Bible is always talking about, where everybody, everybody, is blind. He doesn't, he has never heard the gospel. He doesn't know anything apart from just falling and prophecies and empty prophecies after empty prophecies. Have you ever seen churches who are like that? Every day is prophesying. Come on, my friend, if you're in such kind of churches, listen to what the Bible says. If you're in such kind of churches, look at the, the Bible in Matthew. Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 7, 13. It says something here. And I want to stamp what I'm talking about. Matthew 7, uh, Matthew 7, 13, it says something here, which I need you to be so careful about. The Bible says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein. There are so many people who are going through the wide gate. What kind of wide gate is this? where they encourage, they don't tell you, hey, you're a sinner, you need to repent, uh, um, change these, your evil ways. And if you're doing wrong things over and over, they, they tell you, please examine, my brother, are you really in the salvation? They will tell you, come here, as long as you're giving tithes, as long as you're helping the poor, as long as uh, you never miss Sundays, as long as you do good things, you know, God will always love you. He loves you the way you are. He doesn't really care if, you are an evil person, if you're a criminal, he doesn't really care. Yes, of course, when you're saved, God does not look at this because the Holy Spirit is in you and he guides you. He convicts you unto righteousness. But that time, I never really got to understand all these things because number one, if you're not saved, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, there's nothing to guide you and tell you, Keith, why are you doing these wrong things and you've already been saved? Why are you doing this. Come on, you're being saved by grace. Continue. Do what is right. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict you unto righteousness, not to condemn you, but to convict you. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, who is going to con uh, convict you? Who is going to tell you, walk in this way, don't walk in this way? Are you seeing the picture of what I'm talking about? And most people who are in the lost churches where they are never told what salvation is, many of the people in that church, they're not even saved. They don't even know what is salvation. I've talked to so many pastors and so many friends in different churches and I've asked them, hey, brother, tell me, how is someone saved? And people will tell me, you see, you're saved by, you know, a praying. There is that, uh, they call it Toba, the, the sinner's prayer. When uh, you're prayed for that prayer, you, you get saved. You repeat that. Some say that. Others, they say different things. They say this and that. Others, they say just believe in Jesus. You see, even the Bible says even demons believe and they tremble. They know Jesus is the son of God. They believe and they tremble. Are they saved? No. That is half a gospel. But of course, I'm going to explain to you in detail so that you can be able to understand why it's so important to test if you're in the faith. Okay? So, going on. Uh, let me also show you in uh, verse 14, it says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Are you hearing what the Bible is saying? Few people find this way. Remember what the Bible says, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. How many people are able to find the way? Very few people. Many people think, there's something that I can do to gain salvation. Like actually myself, back in those days, I used to ask, what is it that I've not really done? Uh, I've missed church two, day, uh, two Sundays. Probably because of missing church like that, maybe my, my salvation is called now. I think I need to change something. I need, uh, I've not given tithe. And I could feel, wow, I did not give my tithe. My pastor was talking about that. I did not give my offering. Maybe I did not contribute for this and this and this. And, this. and I thought, probably I might lose my salvation because I've not done this. You see, 
I used to believe that there's something that I can buy salvation with. If I, they, <laughs> there's even a day, I remember, I went and did some business somewhere and I was saying, I'll just go and get all this money and go and buy my pasta a car. Or maybe I just go and change something. I just buy seats in the church and everything. And, and I think this one will bring me closer to God. Are you seeing the way people think and the way people calculate when you're a lukewarm Christian who doesn't really understand what salvation is? Those are things that I could think about. But now, good news. In 2017, 2017 uh, something major happened in my life. I started all of, all of a sudden having interest in the end time, you know, uh, end time news and end time things. And you know, what is the mark of the beast? I started having a lot of crazy interest in those things. And I was asking myself, why am I having a lot of interest in these things? And I never used to really be someone loving, you know, being at the computer all the time and things like that. But I always found myself wanting to do a lot of research. And I wanted to know the cause of everything, be, what is behind every, every discussion, behind everything. I, I was not this kind of people who would just follow, uh, follow what people are saying. I was always controversial. I loved to check what is the reason behind that person saying that? What is the reason behind this thing that you're being told to do? What is the reason behind why um, pastor says this? For example, I used to ask myself, okay, we give tithes, but where do pastors give their tithes to? You see, those kind of controversial thoughts. I used to ask myself, we do this, but where is the command to do it? We do this, and why, why is the church called Pentecostal church? It was based on the day of Pentecost. So I could ask myself, then if it's the day of Pentecost, are we, or what is really happening? I could join dots of different things. Think about Baptist church. What actually do they believe? So I started wanting to know several things and especially on the end time things. I started asking myself, what is the mark of the beast? Who are the 144,000 people? Who are the two witnesses of revelation? Who are these beasts that we hear? And I remember my sisters would all the time tell me, Keith, you love controversies, you love conspiracies and all that. I tell them it's not like that, but I just feel it in my heart that I want to research all these things. So within that time, I started even questioning myself, why do people fall when they are prayed for? Why is it that some people speak in tongues? And yet me, I remember one time I told my mother, I want to receive this uh, speaking in tongues that people speak. She told me, okay, you just have to believe. And then uh, whenever you, the, the pastor is praying for you, just uh, release your tongue. And then those words will start coming out. And I remember I went to so many afternoon prayers where pastors were praying. And I and absolutely, before God, I'm, I'm so sincere about this. I was so sincere on those days. I remember there's a day I was so sincere. I said, this day I have to speak in tongues. And I release myself and I do everything which I'm supposed to do. And the pastor comes, you know, he's pushing us. Most of these pastors are fake. They're just pushing people. They pushed me and I fell down and I, and I was like, the people are talking and they're saying those words that they say, rabba, rabba, and, and, and I'm trying, but it's not coming out. And I'm saying, I, I won't pretend that uh, it's happening on me. No, I won't pretend. It has to happen. If it's really true that uh, the mouth is caught by I don't know what and you start speaking, let it happen to me. Of course, I never saw it. And I started questioning such kind of things. And I was like, mm, there are some things which are not really right. And I need not to be just any other person. I need to be someone who believes based on understanding, not based on crowd. You see, most people, they believe they are in salvation. They are in a, they are saved by, by the matter of what they had, how people are saved, but not in a matter of understanding. You see, salvation is all about understanding. You really have to understand what are you believing in. If I come and tell you, believe in this glass of water right now, you'll have to ask me, okay, what is the essence of me believing in this water? It's like the way people celebrate Easter. Right now we know we are towards Easter, okay, the Easter Sunday this weekend and people they say oh we celebrate easter is the you know the the when jesus resurrected and all that and but you've never gone back to the books and understood why easter who was easter to understand that easter was a false god who was called ishtar 
the goddess Ishtar. And there's nothing in the Bible like Easter. What we are commanded to celebrate is Passover, not even Easter. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. And uh, you're there celebrating and doing things that you don't even understand. And there was those kind of people, but something started changing in 2017. I started feeling, I need to do more research. I just don't want to be ignorant person. I'm not the ignorant person. I, and I felt there's something wrong with, uh, with my spiritual life. I felt God has to do something on me. I, I, there's something wrong with my spiritual life. And I need just to adjust myself because I'm enjoying both sin and I'm enjoying things of God. How can you be, <laughs> the Bible says, you cannot drink in the cup of God and the cup of demons. So I was confused. Why am I enjoying the cup of demons? Every weekend, I'm in every high-end club. I'm partying. Those who know me, they know I used to, I was a party, party boy. I used to party morning to evening, every day. Drink, do all those kind of things that people do in parties. Every weekend, I'm partying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm cursing, I'm everything else. But on Sundays... I'm the most holy guy who is spitting a uh, Bible like no man's business. And I was drinking from the cup of God and the cup of the devils. And I was feeling that there's something which is really not right. So 2017 passed, 2018 passed. Then 2019, around September, towards uh, my birthday, I was born in September 21st. Around September in 2019, I had a dream. So the, in this dream, I actually had two dreams. And one of the dreams, they, 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 both of them were rapture dreams. I saw rapture dreams, two of them. They were so profound, so pre uh, precise, until I could not really think straight. I was always scared about these dreams that I saw. Now, one of the dreams that I saw was, uh, the first dream is that I saw uh, it was just a normal day. A day has just ended normally. And then uh, the following morning, when we wake up, I heard people talking and saying that the president, you know, I'm in Kenya, our president Uhuru Kenyatta has gotten lost, like he's nowhere to be seen. And I was like, what are you talking about? People are saying, they're speaking like in low tones, the president cannot be seen. Since last night, he's not been seen from state house. He, nobody knows where he is. He's not died, but he's not been seen. There's nobody who can trace where he is. And people are speaking a lot on them. And uh, they, of course, I started seeing like people, gangs mobilizing themselves. And it's like they wanted to start rioting and, you know, lawlessness here and there. And I was asking some, I saw uh, uh, an army commander somewhere there. And I asked him, then if the president has left, you know, the second in command is the deputy president. Where, where is the deputy president? He can control the situation so that, you know, there is a calmness with the people and, you know, people can relax. And then it's in the constitution. And then the commander was telling me, no. The president has, has gone with the power. So I was wondering, how can the president go with the power? You know, that thing was really making me wonder. He's gone with the power. So even the deputy has no power. So the country has, and the president has gone with a couple of people and things like that. It's like he has gone with all the power. So now there's no power. There's no vision. There's no nothing in the country. And people are just like that. Then all of a sudden, uh, something started telling me that I need to mobilize people and tell them now the next instructions from now, because it's going to get tough and going to get so bad and things like that. And there are some things that I knew that people did not know. So I was telling people, this is what you need to do. From here now, uh, you're supposed to go in this place and do this. I was like organizing people. And then when I woke up, I started thinking and asking myself, how come the president is not there and what really happened? And how why why would he go with the with all the power and then back in my mind answers were coming up and telling me this is a picture of the rapture the president that i've seen is not actually the president it is the presence of god the presence of god has left together with the saints and the people who believed in god the power of god has left and now every other person who has been left there, whether he looks um, as a leader or not a leader or things like that, they are just there and they don't really understand how things are to be run. And the reason why I was seeing myself organizing people and telling them, uh, this is what you need to do, this is because I had a little bit knowledge of the Bible and I was a, a picture of the tribulation saints. The people who knew the Bible 
but they never believed in Jesus Christ. So at least you know that the rapture has happened and this is what you are supposed to encourage people and tell them, this is the way to go. Uh, people will have to be beheaded for the work of Christ. Don't take the mark of the beast, don't do this. So it was a picture like that. That was the first dream that I saw. Now, the second dream, it was something similar. And uh, I saw, I was just in my house where I live and uh, we were preparing to go to some party or to some event, something like that. So I, I could see some ladies in the building. They are doing some makeup in the next uh, apartment. They are doing some makeups. Others, they are, you know, wiping shoes. They're just doing like preparation. And I could hear downstairs uh, um, uh, buses and uh, trains, they are honking, you know. Pip, 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 pip. Hey, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's about time. Let's go, let's go. And people were was saying, ah, come on, hold on, hold on. They just go to the balcony. They say, we are coming, we're coming. We're just finishing. I just want to brush my teeth. They were just doing normal things like, you know, organizing themselves. They're not saying that they don't want to go to the party. It was like an event where people were going to some stadium or something like that. So there were buses outside, uh, motorbikes, uh, trains, uh, helicopters. I remember even so... Uh, the Sonko rescue team, you know, buses, they were there waiting for people. And people were talking about, hey, let's go, let's go. And the drivers were honking and saying, guys, if you're left, if you're left behind, we will not come back. And people are saying, just wait, I want to pick my handbag, I want to brush my teeth, I want to comb my hair. Instead of coming out and uh, getting into the buses and going, people had excuses of different things. And I was among them. And the next minute I checked, at the balcony, I saw all the buses and all the trains and everything, they have just left. And now it's deserted outside there. And it just, I can just see some uh, parking boys, one there and some dirty, dirty guys who are looking like mad men. They looked like uh, zombies, some places there. They're just walking, walking around. And I heard somebody say, now, because you have been left behind, you have to walk to where the ceremony is. And... Uh, you having to walk, remember, it's very dangerous. And these parking boys and these thugs and these zombies and things like that, they might even eat you up. So you need to be very careful because the road is going to be very tough. And if you're left here, uh, I don't know what they were saying that you're not supposed to be left here. If you're left here, probably you'll be killed. Or I don't know. It was a story like that. And I was seeing mobilizing people and telling them how we will use a certain route and another route. And we try to call those people there, but they, they told us we cannot come back. When we have left, we have left. We cannot come back. You have to find your way to where we are by foot. So those two dreams, the second dream, also analyzing it and thinking about it and just wondering what is happening. I saw it was also another explanation of the rapture. It was like, these buses are an explanation of, you know, preachers and people and, uh, you know, men of God out there calling people and telling them, prepare yourself, Jesus is about to come. Let's go, let's go get in the bus. The bus is, the bus is salvation. And just like the way most people are always saying, let me just, uh, you know, apply some oil on me. Let me do this and that. Let me ar arrange myself. Let me, there, there are some things. Let me wipe my shoes. Let me brush my teeth. You see, these people are not left behind. We were not left behind because we were doing anything wrong. We were just uh, preparing ourselves. We're just doing normal things. Remember the Bible, what it says concerning the times of Noah, that the times of Noah, as it was, so it shall be when the son of man comes. That time of Noah, people were eating, they were planting, they were drinking, they were giving in marriage. Those are not wrong things. These people are doing normal things. And yet they were left behind. Why? Because they never got into the ark. Are you seeing the point? That's why they were destroyed. And that's the same picture I saw. And uh, having understood that, it started hitting in me and asking myself, but I always thought I'm saved. Why am I seeing uh, dreams that have been left behind? Why am I seeing that I'm being left behind? Why am I the one organizing people instead of being in the party and in the, in the function where people are, I've been left behind? And then God started dealing with me. And he started telling me, Keith, you need to examine yourself. Examine your salvation. You're not even saved. The reason I'm even showing you the, these things is to tell you for sure you're not even saved. Because I remember before I dreamt those uh, dreams, I kept on telling God, God, am I really saved? Please just prove to me. Show me a way. 
show me something that I can understand if I'm saved or I'm not, because I'm confused. I always go to church. I listen to the preachers. I do whatever they ask, but, and I say that prayer, I think I'm saved. Why is it that I'm always confused like this? And let me tell you, the Bible says, seek and you shall find. Ask and it will be given unto you. God is not a respecter of man. He will give you exactly what you ask him. And because I asked God to show me if I'm really saved, God gave me those two dreams, which showed me, Keith, you'll be left behind like no man's business. If the rapture happens, you'll be left behind and you'll be the one organizing people because at least you read some parts of the Bible and you know where the Bible says about the end times and don't take the mark of the beast. You'll be among the people organizing others and telling them, this is how you will do things. Eh? Because the others will be blind. They don't even understand. Are you seeing the picture? So now, this one gave me a major urge to start learning about the gospel. I said specifically, I, I need to research about what salvation is. And I, don't, I didn't know who to ask. I remember I called a couple of pastors. Most of them, they were just telling me the old stuff. Because let me tell you, where you put your trust really matters. That's why the Bible is so profound and so specific. And it tells you, put your trust in Jesus, not in a man. Don't even put your trust in me. Don't even put your trust in your pastor or your neighbor or your mother or anyone. Put your trust in Christ and tell him, Jesus Christ, please help me. Show me the truth because I'm lost. When I ask this pastor, he's telling me something different. When I ask my, 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 my friend, he's telling me something different. When I ask this uh, other friend or this other person or this other pastor or this bishop, everybody's giving me his own story, his own different point of view of you know, salvation. When I ask some people, what is the gospel? Some are telling me, you see, the gospel is the whole Bible. Now I ask them, now, do I have to read the whole Bible to understand salvation or what? When I ask others, they tell me, uh, the gospel is found in um, John 3, 16, believe in Jesus. But then I think I believed in Jesus, but I'm not understanding what I'm believing. Are you seeing most of the time you're told believe in this, but you're not told how is it, how are you going to do it? You know, if I tell you, believe in me, you should ask me, why should I believe in you? Because I am a good person. Why are you a good person? Because you helped someone or you did this and that. And why was that person who was held important so that he can make you a good person? You see, you have to go back to the story and understand. The same way we see, you're told, believe in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus died for your sins. Why did he have to die for your sins? Because you are a sinner. And why? How did you become a sinner? Because uh, Adam, your father, sinned and you got his seed from sin. You see how you go behind to understand the whole thing? You can never be saved without understanding the logic behind I don't know if you're understanding that. So now I started researching and telling God, please, God, show me the truth. I'm really lost and confused and all that. That was uh, just towards uh, uh, the uh, towards nearing uh, the end of the year and all those things happened. And we started hearing a little bit about, you know, the pandemic here and there, st small, small stories about COVID. And uh, in 2020, I was uh, working, I used to uh, supply some stuff in uh, different institutions. And of course, my job was okay. I was working very well. I had two guys who were working uh, for me and uh, one, one being my driver, the other one who was uh, doing some uh, different stuff and they had families. And so, we're so I'm supporting these two guys. I'm supporting other people. I'm also supporting myself. I'm supporting people at home and I'm, and I'm working normal stuff. And I, I used to feel in my heart, God telling me, Keith, I need you to stop what you're doing and go back to Nairobi because that time I traveled, I think I was in Kisi, I was supplying some stuff there, uh, some products which I was selling. So I was in Kisi and then God is telling me every day in my mind is ringing. I remember it was around February. It's ringing in my mind, Keith, you need to go back to Nairobi. So I pray and ask God, why do you want me to go to Nairobi? He's telling me that go and read the Bible. Go and sit down and do research and read the Bible. There's no time. There's no time. There's no time. I used to wonder, how comes? But I give all sorts of excuses. But you see, God, I'm working. I have people who are looking. I'm looking. Uh, I'm helping. They're looking after me and uh, things like that. And I could give all sorts of excuses. But I remember one day, it was on February 28th. February 28th, 2020. I remember it must have been on a Thursday. Now that night on Thursday, 
I was sleeping that day. I just went to work and uh, went and did my work. And then I came back to the hotel room where I was staying uh, earlier. So by eight, I already slept. I didn't have much to do. Uh, and uh, my guys who used to work for me, they, they were in the other next room. So I, I slept. So now sleeping at eight by 10 at night, I, I woke up and I could not breathe. And I was like, it's like I'm being choked. And it's like the whole air is stuffy and, and I'm sweating and things are just confusing. And I'm feeling as if I'm so much terrified and tensed. And I'm wondering what is wrong? Why? I remember I, I even opened the window and tried to breathe from, you know, from the window to get to gulp some air and ask myself, so why is it that I'm feeling this way? And what is really wrong? I'm sweating and I'm confused. And then deep in my mind, I started hearing the voice, you know, a voice is, it's it, this kind of cool voice that God speaks with, like, like a simple, calm voice. Of course, there are two kinds of voices. You see, it's very important to understand these voices. There's one loud voice, which I believe, of course, is always the Satan's voice, because always speaking loudly and giving you all these fake ideas, which you really know this one is not can never be from God, telling you all the crazy things. But there's another still voice which was telling me, Keith, I need you tomorrow to go back to Nairobi and go and read the Bible, go sit down, be with yourself and just study because the time is at hand. There's no much time left. And uh, some something big is going to happen. I didn't know what was to happen. Actually, even COVID does not had not even come to Kenya. It was just some fairy tales in China and things like that. So when I was there, feeling this, I started making, you know, discussing with that voice in my mind. And I'm just discussing in my mind and just saying, no, you see, I can't go because uh, I have to finish this project. I have to do this and that. You see, my job is okay. You see these people, what will happen? They have families. You see, you give all your excuses. I've not uh, finished this. I have a debt there. I have this and that. God, if it's really you, I've, I, I, I need to have some money to pay some rent, to pay my bills. And I gave all sorts of excuses, but I was not even getting sleep even one second. And I argued and argued. I, I remember until almost uh, three at night. I never got sleep. Three at night, I said, okay, let me just tell this voice which is speaking to me that yes, tomorrow I will go, but of course I will not go. So I said, okay, fine, tomorrow I'm leaving. <laughs> but have you ever seen that you can never lie to God because God <laughs> looks at your thoughts, he sees your thoughts, he sees your heart. He knows that you're lying. I could not even get sleep. It's all... Keith, you're lying. You're not going back tomorrow. You're lying. That sentence you said so that you can get sleep and sleep, it won't happen. And at 4 a.m. in the morning, I decided completely 100%, tomorrow I'm going back and I'm going to do exactly what I'm feeling God telling me. I did not even finish five minutes. I was already asleep. So having slept, I woke up in the morning. We used to wake up at six in the morning so that we prepare ourselves. And then uh, by seven, we are having breakfast. By eight, we are at work. So that day I slept. I actually woke up at seven, seven, seven thirty. And then my job guys, they're wondering, hey, what's wrong with our boss today? What's, hey, dude, what's, what's happening? Well, <laughs> you have slept too much. To... I told them, guys, there's a change of plan. Uh, we need to go back to Nairobi because I feel God is telling me uh god is telling me that uh, there's something coming so big and there is no time so these guys first they they just smiled and told me hey kid you guy and all these your predictions and god has said this god has said this because i was always saying those things but one thing i really thank them is because they understood that there's power in in jesus and god speaks and they did not discourage me i really thank them one is called steve the other one is a uh, is called Kim. I talked to them and they, they understood and they told me, okay, Keith, let's go back then. I don't understand how it's going to be, but you're leaving job, you're leaving everything that you're doing. Your job is well paying. You have people everywhere, but you've decided to follow what God is telling you. It's okay. Uh, we went, I remember I did not even have a lot of money. I had uh, maybe five or 7,000 shillings with me. All the other money was just, you know, in businesses, you know how you go and supply things and you're waiting to be paid here and there. So I didn't have anything. I just had like 7,000 shillings with me. And remember, I'm in Kisi, a place I have to pay 
fuel have to fuel my car almost 3500 shillings back to nairobi so i went and fueled and we went back to nairobi when you get go to my house i told guys god is going to provide i don't know how it's going to be but just mysterious ways god provided small small stuff and i was able to release them and i was left alone in my house and uh i was there being left alone in my house i think sometimes god wants you to be alone so that you can be able to understand now Within not very long time, uh, I went to the village and I stayed there for a while. I just felt like I just need to be away from a place of any distraction. It did not even finish one week. The country was locked down because of COVID. And uh, having been locked down, I was like, now I started realizing how comes God was telling me something huge was coming, but I was not seeing it. I didn't see the country being locked. Like how now? Now, sitting back at home, of course, some payments, which I had done uh, businesses here and there, of course, I was getting some payments here and there. And God was providing in different ways and different mysterious ways. And I remember I started studying, studying and studying. And one day when I was studying, I heard the small voice again in my mind ask me, Keith, what do you have? You remember how Moses was asked by, by God, what do you have? And he said, I have a staff here. And he was told this stuff, you're going to use it to, you know, show miracles to the Egyptians, turn it to, you know, to a snake. It will turn to a snake. You know, you will, you will put this and that. You, you know, God asks you, what actually do you have so that he can use what you have? And I told God, God, right now where I am, I'm in the village. Uh, I only have my mobile phone and some, some data. So that's the only thing I have. I don't even know how to read the Bible. I remember I used to read, uh, I used to have an NIV Bible and it was really confusing me because I can't even see where the gospel is. Like, you see, most of these new age Bibles, they are really corrupt. Please, if you're using an NIV, you're using these new age uh, Bibles, run away from them. They are perverted. Like NIV has almost 1,600 verses missing of the Bible verses changed others removed those are bibles which have been created by people who are just after you know perverting the gospel of jesus that's why people don't even understand the gospel so now being there at home sitting there i heard the voice ask me keith what do you have and i said i have a mobile phone and some data bundles and God told me, start researching about the end time. Just do whatever you can. Just go to YouTube and research and just listen and listen to what people are saying concerning the end times. I started listening. <clears throat> and around there, when I was listening from one person to another, another person to another, I kept on seeing some guy teaching on a whiteboard. And his name was Robert Brecker. So Robert Brecker was teaching on a whiteboard. And then I'm like, this bearded guy who is just teaching some stuff. You know, I used to enjoy the videos with a lot of, you know, boom, and uh, people are showing some, you know, sci-fi stuff and, and all, all these kind of effects and everything. So, so when I see some things, I, I can be shocked and, you know, we feel that thriller thing. But now this guy is teaching on a whiteboard and he's explaining some things which are interesting. And I'm wondering, why is he being kept on being recommended all the time? Recommendation. All the time I'm seeing YouTube recommending Robert Breaker, Robert Breaker. And I was, I remember I, I wanted to research about, um, I did research about who are the 144,000 people. So I said, um, I started researching who are the 144,000 people in the Bible who are being spoken in Revelation. So as I'm checking this person, this person, Robert Breaker is being again, <laughs> suggested there and after that i listened and i was like mm, this guy is really talking bible wow he's more of a bible teacher than a preacher he's actually he's saying he's just saying what the bible is talking about and just uh, elaborates from one verse to another he's basically not even giving his story he's giving and the bible says this and the bible told this now go to this other verse and the bible says it. and i was like this is exactly what i'm looking for i'm looking for somebody who is speaking the bible not somebody giving me his own ideas you see most churches when you go you'll find especially these lukewarm churches the pr prosperity churches most people they're just talking about uh this happened when i was in china when i was in the us i did this and th they, they are talking more about their stories more than the bible and i wanted somebody who will speak the bible and tell me what the bible says and see this verse and jesus said this and this are... 
So this guy, I checked one for 4,000. I checked who are the two witnesses. I, and then I started getting interest. And the moment I, I, you know, there are times that you have watched a video and you want to skip and just check some something different or someone else. I felt something telling me, just hold on, relax, hold on. And the first time I heard him speak about the gospel, what the gospel is and how someone is saved. And he said, you can even check my salvation series playlist on my YouTube channel. So I said, okay, let me go and check this Robert Brecker, the playlist of the salvation, what he's talking about, because it's something that I really want to know. And I went there and I found a playlist which is written concerning, you know, the uh, how to be saved, the assurance of salvation is once saved, always saved, how to know you're saved, the blood atonement of Christ. Man, this is what I was looking for. It was like a fountain. Have you ever seen a fountain open? And this is exactly what I'm looking for. And I did a lot of study. I listened and I, and I remember him telling us, if you don't have a King James Bible, just go and get one because you'd be confused in all these things you'll not even understand. I got myself a King James Bible and I started reading and one verse to another. And, and all of a sudden I got a lot of interest in the word of God and it was now streaming and it was, it was becoming like some cold water in a desert. And I could feel, and I remember my sisters and my mother, they were, they were looking at me and telling me, hey, you, you guy and this Robert Brecker and these preachings of his that, what are you listening? I was telling them, guys, hold on. There's something that I'm listening here. And I know God is trying to tell me something because if God told me to live all the way from Kisi where I was working and he told me go and this and do and this and He's still telling me, listen to this. And I started reading and I started understanding what the gospel is. And I tell you, my brothers and sisters, in uh, having seen all that, in uh, sixth, on 6th of June, 2020, that is the day I'll never forget. That is the day that I really came to understand what the gospel is. And on that day, that very day, I remember our president, Uru Kenyatta, was announcing uh, more lockdowns. Eh? It was on 6th of, uh, of June, 2020. That's the day that I got saved. And I knew 100% without any shout of a doubt, shadow of a doubt, that I am saved. And how did I know I'm, I'm saved? Because I understood the gospel and it has never parted from me. And uh, the Bible tells us one thing. The spirit will testify to your spirit that you're a child of God when you believe. You see, the Holy Spirit started testifying to me and telling me, Keith, from today, you're a child of God. Why? Because you have understood the gospel and you've been saved. Now, let me tell you how I understood this gospel and now I know 100% that I am saved. You see, there are people who can ask you, how did you all those days that all those years? Yes, I was in church since when I was young. I knew that I was saved all the time, but I absolutely was never saved because salvation is about a relationship with Christ. It's about understanding what you're believing in. It's not about some sentence that you'd say. It's not a mantra. It's not giving to the poor. It's not giving to the needy. It's not uh, giving tithes. It's not baptism. Salvation is not all those crap that you always think that this is what is saving you. I thought because I'm giving so much, I remember there's a certain pastor and I, and I talked about him here on Facebook some time back and, and uh, he actually left. He actually blocked me because he knew he was one of the bunch of liars that I don't feel even any remorse trying to, to exposing him. He was called Paul Nzuve. This guy, I used to give, man, have you ever given tithe until you're like, am I buying salvation? Because I used to work, uh, my work was, uh, my work was, you know, you make money every day, every day, every day. So supplying things, I used to supply a lot of stuff. And then because I don't want to accumulate the tithe and give at the end of the month, I used to give every day what I've worked. So every day I could give him 4,000, 5,000, 3,000, 5,000, because sometimes you make much, sometimes you make less. And I, and I remember I could give him all that money every day. Even sometimes when I don't give him the money or, or for, for a day, he could call me and tell me, brother, I've not seen something today. I, I hope everything's okay. I'm praying for you. Hope you're not robbing God. You know, the, the way they always speak. And I thought, will I miss heaven because I'm not giving? God, please, I have to purchase it again. It's like you're buying salvation. And this bunch of liars, they just confuse you and you think that you're giving 
is what gives you salvation, which is not what gives you salvation. And that's why I'm always against anyone who is always telling people that you have to do this and this to be saved. No, you have to believe. Now, let me tell you, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that let, let me just read it for you so that you can understand wh wh where I'm coming from and why I'm, I'm speaking this. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith. It is grace. Grace is what? Getting what you don't deserve. I did not deserve to be saved because I was giving to the poor. I was giving tithes. I was giving all these things because I, I said a prayer maybe on the day of judgment when I stand before God and I tell him, and he asked me, Keith, why do I have to let you in heaven? Because God, I said that prayer. You gave us a prayer to say, and I said that prayer, why are you not letting me in heaven? God, he just tell you, no, Keith, I did not. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is not your prayer. It's not what you do. It's not what you do. Go away from me. Salvation is what I already did at the cross. I gave you free. Have you ever heard that freely you are given, freely give? And when you see somebody or your pastor or somebody is selling you salvation, then that's a liar. You're on the wide road to hell. Please run away from so that kind of people who are selling to you gospel. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I was given grace. Grace is favor. Through faith. Through me showing faith in the giver of the grace, I was saved. And that's not of yourselves. It's not because of me. It is the gift of God. Gift, gift. Can you buy a gift? The time that I was giving, um, I was giving tithes to the pastor uh, and giving him every day. And he's telling me, hey, hey, my brother, are you, I didn't see your tithes today. Are you trying to steal from God? You, you see, I used to think that it is not a gift. I'm buying salvation i used to think and that's what most of the people think that you can buy salvation you cannot buy salvation it is the gift of god not of works lest anyone should boast so salvation is not something that you do some works it's not anything that you do actually the bible says in the book of isaiah that our righteousness is as filthy rags unto god filthy rags god when he looks at your righteousness you're trying to give to the poor you're trying to do this and this so that you're a great person. He just looks at you and says, please, these are filthy rags that you're giving to me. I don't want that. I just want you to believe on the finished work of what Jesus did. Take Jesus' salvation, righteousness, and impart it on yourself. That is the only way I'm going to accept you in heaven. Not because of your own righteousness that you're trying to create. Are you seeing the point? So, going back again to the uh, salvation... The Bible says already that for by grace are you saved through faith. And I got to understand that. And then I saw another verse, which is in Ephesians 1, uh, 13, which says, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So there's something that you need to hear so that you can trust. There's something you need to hear before you can trust you see, salvation is through trust, it's through faith. So there's something you need to hear, which is the gospel of your salvation. Oh, now I was like, mm -hmm. now before I, uh, uh, I continue about this, I ask myself, what is it that I need to hear? What is that gospel? I've asked so many people what the gospel is, and they tell me uh, Matthew, John, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are not the gospel. That, those are gospels speaking about the life and times of Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. The gospel was given to the Apostle Paul. Actually, it was a mystery which was hidden all through. And Paul was given this mystery by Jesus Christ through a revelation. And he was told, go and tell people this is the gospel. This is how they'll be saved. So the gospel is found in the epistles of Paul. And if you see a church or you go to a place where they hardly they hardly talk or uh, preach about uh, preach on the epistles of Paul. Remember, they are lying to you because number one, Paul is our apostle right now. If uh, Romans uh, 11, 13, it says uh, that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And of course, in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. Even if a Jew decides to be saved, he'll become a member of the church. So God re recognizes only three types of people. He recognizes the Jews, 
He recognizes the Gentiles and he recognizes the church. So if you're a Jew, then you're not a Gentile. But if a Jew gets saved, he becomes a member of the church. If a Gentile gets saved, he becomes a member of the church. So in the church, there's no Jew or Gentile. But then otherwise, there are two different kinds of people. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. So us being Gentiles, because we are not Jews, we are supposed to listen to the epistles of Paul for our salvation. Are you seeing, are you seeing the point? Now, Coming back to the story that there's something that you need to hear, which is the gospel of your salvation. Let's see, <clears throat> uh, just uh, down there. In whom also after that you believed, after you hear that gospel of salvation, then you believe that gospel, something happens. Look, the Bible says, in whom also after that you believed, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the moment you believe this gospel, which is being spoken about, which you must hear and which I'll tell you right now, you will be sealed. After you hear it and you believe it, immediately that nanosecond, microsecond, you, you hear and believe that gospel, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This Holy Spirit of promise is the Holy Spirit which Jesus promised. You remember when Jesus was about to leave and he told his disciples, I, will, I am going to my father, but I will not leave you as orphans. But when I go, I'm going to bring you an helper who will abide with you forever. You remember he promised that? He promised an helper who will abide, who will stay with us forever. How will the Holy Spirit stay with us forever? Because he'll be sealed inside us. You see why you cannot lose your salvation? Because the Holy Spirit is always inside you and he locks himself inside, okay? Now, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? The Bible says, verse 14 there, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. There's something that we need to inherit in heaven. We have some rewards in heaven. Uh, we'll be fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. In short, he is our assurance that we will go to heaven. When you have the Holy Spirit inside you, he assures you that, dude, you're going to heaven 100% because I'm inside you. Because the Holy Spirit can never come out from you until the day of redemption, the day that you are redeemed from this body. Okay, are you seeing that? And how can we know that the Holy Spirit cannot live? Look at Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30 says, uh, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because he is sealed inside you. He is there and he's not coming out until the day of redemption. If I seal an envelope and say, this envelope should not be opened until the day of redemption, until Saturday or until a certain day. How are you going to open? And remember, God is powerful. You cannot open it. The Holy Spirit is in you and is sealed there. And you're told, don't grieve him because anytime you do something sinful, you go and do stupid things. You, you lie to people, you do all these things. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. That's why a born again Christian can never enjoy sin. You go to a place where people are smoking and cursing and doing uh, immoral stuff and doing wrong things. And you're a Christian and you feel, I, I'm not supposed to be here. Why, why are these people doing these things? It's not you who does not want to be there. It is the Holy Spirit in you who is grieving, who is saying, no, no, this is not you. You have been saved by grace. You're a clean person. Don't do this. You have already come out from that. That is your old you. Do what is right. He convicts you unto righteousness. He does not condemn you. Condemning you is Satan telling you, uh -huh, you see, uh -huh, you see what you have done? Uh -huh, you, you're going to hell. Now that is Satan condemning you. The Holy Spirit tells you, no, don't do this. Walk in this way. That's why we are told, walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Okay, are you seeing the picture? Now, Another thing that the Holy Spirit, another work of the Holy Spirit inside you, number one, one work is uh, the Holy Spirit is in you as an assurance that you'll go to heaven. Number two, another work why the Holy Spirit is in you, and I want to check this because uh, I, I, yes, I wrote it somewhere here to remember. One is the assurity of salvation, of getting, going to heaven. Number two, the Holy Spirit, when he's in you, he teaches you all things. You remember I was telling you that I could not understand the Bible. 
Back in the days, I could read the Bible and I'm just seeing a bunch of confused words which I cannot even understand. Why is this Bible is so confusing? I can't understand what he's talking about because I did not have the Holy Spirit. But the moment you get the Holy Spirit and you get saved, this Bible comes to life. This is the word of God. And the Bible says that the word of God is life, is alive. This is not a dead word. That's why people have been reading this Bible for thousands and thousands of years. And they are still reading it. How many novels have people read and they cannot read it again because the words are dead. They have already dead, read and that's it. But the Bible comes alive. Every time you read one verse, the Holy Spirit tells you this verse in a certain way. You read it tomorrow, it comes up in another different way. You read it another day, another revelation from the same verse. And you're like, this Bible must be alive. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one teaching you. And he teaches you all things. He teaches you what this Bible is talking about. So that's another work of the Holy Spirit. And he helps you to understand the Bible, to understand the word of God. Are you seeing the work of the Holy Spirit who is sealed in you? Another work of the Holy Spirit is convicting us unto righteousness. Of course, I told you that. He's telling us, walk on this side. Do this which is wrong. Right, don't do what is wrong. And another thing which the Holy Spirit does when he's in you, he gives us discernment. Have you ever uh, taken some time, you're watching a certain movie and you're saying, hey, these people are evil. These people, this is the agenda they are looking for. This is what, but other people cannot see because they don't have the Holy Spirit. Are you seeing even in the agenda which is happening right now in the world? And many people don't, do not see. They can't see. They have eyes which don't see and the ears which can't hear. And they are wondering, Keith, you're saying these things. You're just a conspiracy theorist. You see some Christians that explain, this thing is wrong. We are heading towards the mark of the beast. Please stay away from this thing. And the people cannot see. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not in them. And even people who are in the church, they don't have the Holy Spirit. And you'll even hear pastors and bishops saying, let's go and line up and do what, uh, you know, our scientists are saying. Believe that scientists believe it. And, and <laughs> you see, the Bible tells us, let me show you here. In the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel explains to us so well what will happen in those days. Eh? Listen to this. Mm, it's saying, uh, Daniel 12, verse 10. Listen to what it's saying so that you can see these things you are taught by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not you who understands. Listen to Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. It says, uh, uh, many shall be purified. This is talking about the last days. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. You see, the wicked will do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Why are the wise people understanding? Because the Holy Spirit is in them and is giving them a spirit of discernment to know we are towards the end of time. And we need to believe in the gospel. We need to do what is right because Jesus is about to come. You see, the Holy Spirit will give you discernment. You will understand things that people are, cannot understand. The Bible tells us that uh, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Okay? So a normal person, a carnal person cannot understand. Are you seeing the picture? Now, let's go back again. Now, we have understood the work of the Holy Spirit and that we need to have the Holy Spirit after we believe the gospel. Now, we hear and we believe the gospel. So let's ask ourselves, so which, what is this gospel? Where is this gospel that we are supposed to believe so that we can be able to be saved? Where is this gospel and where do we find it? Now, the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That is where we find the gospel. And if you're looking for the gospel anywhere else, then this, unless you're just joining the dots, like the way you can say gospel is found in different places. But here is where it is explained completely by the Apostle Paul. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now, you see, he has declared this is the gospel. Gospel means what? It means the good news, okay? Which I preached unto you, so Paul already preached to the people the good news and uh, which you have received and where you stand. So Paul already was preaching this good news. He preached some time back. Of course, this one is just affirming and saying, this is what I've been preaching to you and which you received. So how do you receive the gospel? By faith. How do you receive the good news? By faith. Salvation is by faith. It's not by doing anything. It's by faith. Are you seeing? 
and wherein you stand. So what you're standing in, you're not standing on your good works. You're not standing on your tights like the way I was standing on those things and the way I was standing on my good works and this and this. I'm standing on the gospel. This is where if Jesus stops you and asks you, Keith, why do you want to get into heaven? God, I'm standing on the gospel that you gave me, that this is the gospel. You told me this, I will be saved. And you proved to me, and I received that gospel, and I stood on it. Now, let's continue. By which also you are saved. This is the gospel which saves you. This is the good news which saves you. And we are seeing what exactly makes you get saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now, listen to what he's saying. Keep in memory what I preached unto you. Why is keeping in memory the gospel very important? You see, a good picture of what I used to do back then, probably I might have read this uh, verse and I might have said, oh, you know, Jesus died for our sins, blah, blah, blah. And I probably had read that verse, but I had never kept it in memory. That's why I had never been saved. Because remember the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law. They knew the whole law inside out. They knew everything concerning what God had given. But how comes when Jesus came, he said, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of these Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? And these Pharisees, they were the most learned people of the law, the law of God, not the law of Satan, the law of God. Why? Because they never understood it. They never kept it in memory. Do you remember when you were in school and your teacher was finding you, maybe you're cramming pi r square, pi r square. You're trying to cram some formulas and he's telling you, stop cramming. Understand the formula. Because when you understand, it will come from your mind to your heart. And even, even 10, 20 years down the line, you will still remember that formula because you understood it. You see? You see why you need to understand the gospel? Why you need to understand just reading the Bible and saying, oh, this is the gospel, and then you say some prayer, and then you think you're saved. You're not saved, my friend, until you understand. Until you understand, and it comes to your mind, wow, this is really what happened. This is why Jesus had to die. This is why, this is how I am saved. Until you hear that, you can never be saved. That's why the Bible is always talking about, make sure that you understand the gospel understand you keep it in memory now let's continue what i preached unto you unless you believed in vain verse three for i delivered unto you first that which i also received okay now paul is saying i'm not giving you my own gospel i'm giving you what i already received and we can see how what did uh, paul receive he received the gospel through a revelation of uh, jesus revealing him revealing to him the gospel now let's see where did paul have this revelation in galatians chapter 1 verse 11 paul explains how he received this gospel he says but i certify to you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man it's not after man it's not my gospel for i neither received it of man Okay, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is saying, this gospel that I'm giving you is not from men. It's not some traditions of men. The way I see most churches, they create their own traditions. Like the Catholic church, they have their own church traditions. And you think you're saved by the Catholic church and these traditions or other churches out there. You think you're saved by that. No, you're not saved by that. It is a revelation of Jesus, which was given to the Apostle Paul, which he tells us, this is how you're supposed to be saved. Now look at um, verse three. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, this word, how, you can never find it in any other Bible except the King James Bible. You see why it's important to have the King James Bible? All the other Bibles will give you another, you know, mixed up story. So you'll never understand. You'll never see the word how. Because the word how gives you the whole essence of salvation. If you know how that Christ died. Now you ask yourself, how did Jesus die? Because if you know how Jesus died, you will understand salvation. 
And when you understand the salvation, it will come from your mind to your heart. And the, the Bible tells us you have to believe from your heart. Are you seeing the picture? So it's all about how Christ died for your sins. How did Jesus die? Let's ask ourselves this question. And this is the question I ask myself. Jesus died by shedding of his blood. He was taken at the cross and he shed every liter of his blood from his body. Everything, everything, every blood dropped from his uh, body was shed until he started shedding water. Now, you may ask yourself, why did Jesus have to shed that blood? Could there be no salvation in another way? Now, let me ask you, if Jesus could have died of a heart attack, he has been strangled or he drowned in water or he fell from uh, to top of a mountain and he died and there's no shedding of blood. Could there be salvation? No. Why? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins or there's no remission of sins. Are you seeing now? Are you coming to the background of understanding salvation, understanding why actually most of the things that people believe are not even salvation. Now you have understood how that Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. And why was the blood important? Because without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And now we ask ourselves the third question. Why is there no forgiveness if there is no shedding of blood? And the answer is found in Leviticus 17, 11, which says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Oh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh -huh. And I have given you the blood to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that atones for the soul. Are you seeing this? The life of the flesh is in the blood. So if I remove blood from your body, you, then you have died. This is a picture of you dying. And now when we look at this, we are like, mm -hmm. now I understand why Jesus had to remove his own blood from his body. So that death could occur. So that through his death, removing the blood that he removed from his body, his shedding of blood, then there could be forgiveness of sins. Then you ask yourself another question. Why is the blood so important then for people to be forgiven? Why is there importance of blood? Why did God have to say that, okay, people have to remove their blood uh, they have to die, sorry. They have to die so that they can be forgiven sins. Why is death important for forgiveness of sins? Because the Bible says in the book of Romans that uh, uh, it, it says that um, the wages of sin is death. So God said that I have a rule. Whosoever will sin, he must die. And for you to die, you must shed blood, okay? So if I shed my blood right now. I just pluck this one finger out and then blood oozes off from me and it is every liter of my blood in, in me. I will die. But if I cut my hands and cut my legs and then, I, and, and then we bind them very well and I don't lose my blood, I will still be alive. Why? Because the blood has not left. Because the life has not left. So that's why you've now come to understand life for you to be able to forgive and to be forgiven, then there has to be death for the forgiveness of sins. And this one brings us to the time of Adam. You remember when Adam sinned, he ate from the forbidden uh, fruit, Adam and Eve. What happened? God came and he showed them grace. He was supposed to kill them right there and then. Of course, they died. They died spiritually. Okay. But God showed them grace. And what did God do? God, he killed an animal. Blood was shed of an animal. And he took the skin of that animal and he clothed them. Okay? He covered their sin with the, with the, with the, with the a skin of an animal. So meaning he performed a ritual. He shed blood so that uh, people could cover their sins through uh, this animal's skin and this animal's blood. It was just a symbol that the blood has been shed because these people have sinned. Are you seeing? So the first person to shed blood was God himself. And as we continue, we see uh, uh, Cain and Abel, you know, the shedding blood, going to give offering. And we see uh, Abraham, we see over and over blood, blood, blood. And we even see in, the, old, uh, in the, the laws of Moses, when somebody sinned, they had to shed blood. They had to go to the altar. 
when you sinned, this was the law given to Moses, that whenever somebody sins, he must come with a cal, a, a lamb, you know, a small sheep, a lamb, a very young, tender, uh, without blemish, very young looking. Have you ever seen this kind of lamb which is so innocent and you look at it and you just say, I'm going to kill this one. It has done nothing. It's just so young. It has never even fought. It has never even done anything. Now, it's like a picture of God wanted to, to show you how sin is, makes him feel. You are supposed to be clean and blameless, but you have sinned. You have defiled yourself. And God tells you, pick that lamb. People used to pick the lamb, which is without blemish, very young and, uh, you know, very clean, a male, a male one. And then you go to the altar and you hold it like this. And then you slit the throat of that lamb. And then when the blood is coming out, the priest could come with, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some, some item like a bowl or something like that. And then he would fetch the blood. You know, you're holding yeah, the lamb here. You're the one who has cut the throat. It's basically like you've said, this is supposed to be me. It's supposed to be me shedding my blood, but I'm shedding the blood of this innocent lamb who has done nothing for the sake of me. So I'm trusting this blood which is being shed is supposed to be my blood which is being shed. Are you seeing the picture? So now, after you do that, the, uh, the, 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 the priest could go and, you know, sprinkle that blood in the, in the altar up there, you know, in those instruments of the altar, and then the other one would be poured uh, down below the altar. And you could go home rejoicing and say, wow, now I have my sins covered. Why? Because you have trusted that lamb, the blood which has come out, that it was supposed to be your blood. And, you know, through this blood, I've had uh, my sins covered. Are you seeing? Now, did you tell the lamp, please lamp, come into my heart? Come into my heart, lamp. Then now why do you tell Jesus come into my heart? It's a different, if you understand the essence of the blood, then you'll understand salvation. Now let's continue. Then now Jesus comes. You see God looked, you, you see with the, this uh, cutting of the lamp and all that and shedding of blood of an animal, that blood, could only cover your sins, but it could not redeem you. You only had remission of sin, but not redemption of sin, okay? Redemption or picking away sins completely. You could not be forgiven forever. It was like the way you see when somebody has cancer and uh, he's on drugs, chemo, they say that cancer is on remission. It has left, but it will come back at some point. So with the blood of the animals, your sins were only covered. There was only remission of sins for a while, but there was no redemption okay but now god looked when he was uh, up in heaven and he's seeing these people are sinning every minute they are sinning every second sin 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 they come out from the altar before they reach down they have abused someone they have already been, been corrupted they have done this uh, so they have to go back over and over and over and over and over so god when he was in heaven he said i love to send my son jesus christ to come and become that lamb because the blood of Jesus is very powerful. It will forgive. It will basically take every sin away. Okay? Now, let's see in the, in the book of John. John explains to us exactly, exactly. Now, look at this. Mm, it says, John, uh, John verse one, chapter 1, verse 29. Listen, when Jesus was coming to be baptized, what did John the Baptist say about Jesus? Listen to this. John 1 verse 29, he says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the lamb of God. You see, he's calling him what? The lamb, okay? The lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is not coming to cover the sin. He's coming to completely pluck out sin from the world. He's coming to completely forgive the whole world. Okay, who takes away the sin of the world? Okay, now why was uh, John the Baptist saying that Jesus is coming as a lamb? Because he will be killed as that lamb. His blood would be shed, but now this blood will be so powerful that it will not cover the sin anymore, but it will pluck it out. You'll be forgiven your past, your present, and your future sins. Are you seeing that? But with the animal's blood, you are forgiven the past sins. That's why you're always sinning and you're going back again and you're sinning and you're going back again. Now, do we have to, uh, to, to have Jesus at the cross again? No, because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, and Christ, he died once 
for the sins of all people once. And you remember Jesus at the cross when he, he, he died? What did he say? He said, it is finished. What was finished? The payment of sin was finished. Everything which was supposed to be done, it was finished. He has forgiven everyone. He has forgiven all the corrupt politicians. He has forgiven Hitler. He's forgiven who and who, Mussolini and all the dictators and all murderers in the world. He's forgiven every person in the world. But now, why is it that if he has forgiven everyone, then why doesn't everyone go to heaven? You know, that's the next question we should ask ourselves. It is because of one thing. Jesus forgave everyone. He shed his blood for the sake of everyone. So that blood that Jesus was shedding, it was for the forgiveness. It was supposed to be your blood which is being shed. But he shed his blood and gave you righteousness. So that if you believe that this blood that Jesus shed was for me, then you're forgiven completely of your sins. Okay, are you seeing that? And when you're forgiven, immediately the Holy Spirit comes inside you and he's sealed in you and it does not go away. And now he will direct you and is the assurance that you're going to heaven. Are you seeing the picture? So the blood is really the key component for your salvation. It is not a prayer. It is not anything that you do. It is not this and this and this and this and all those things that people think about. That's why you need to understand the gospel. Are you seeing so now the blood is the most important thing which gives you forgiveness of sins. Now let's see in Ephesians 1 7, it tells us that the blood is the one which gives us forgiveness of sins. Now see Ephesians 1 7, it says, In whom we have redemption, he's talking about Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood. You see, we are redeemed through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, how are we supposed to have forgiveness through his blood? We are just supposed to have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you seeing? Now, look at this. Uh, Romans, Romans uh, 3.25, it tells us why we have to have faith in that blood. Romans 3.25, it says, whom God has set forth, God is talking about uh, his son, Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation is a substitute. He set him forth to be a substitute for you. You're supposed to be there dying, but he's replaced him with Jesus, his son, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. All right? Are you seeing faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God? So God has set forth Jesus to be a propitiation, a substitute for your sin through faith. You only need to have faith and believe that this blood which was shed is supposed to be my blood. But Jesus has done the same. So now when you understand this and you believe in it and you believe and you say, oh, this is why... This is how I'm saved, by believing that blood. Now you have taken the righteousness of Jesus and imparted on yourself. It's like you've said, the blood which Jesus shed, that death and resurrection of him, I've taken it and now it's mine. He died with me. He resurrected with me. And his righteousness is mine. Jesus came and he fulfilled the whole law. Okay, the Bible says that Jesus did not come to destroy, but to fulfill the law. So Jesus came and he fulfilled the whole law because he, he was born uh, sinless and he died sinless. Okay, of course, he was he took our sins away as a sinless man. So he was righteous. So I took his righteousness and put on me. I took his fulfilling of the law and put it on me. So there is nothing that I need to do, but only trust in the finished work of Jesus. And then when I trust in that, imagine I am saved. That's the only thing that you need to do. So when you do that, because it's all about believing, it's not about something that you do. Okay. So then after that, now you're already saved. If, uh, if it's about confessing, the Bible also talks about confessing. You can go ahead and confess, but confession is not what saves you. Look at this. Mm, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, 
It's not about just calling with your mouth. You call from the heart. You call from understanding. This confession thing, you're just confessing what was ready you know. Can you confess what you don't know? Can you go to a court of law and you say, I want to confess about that thuggery and you don't know how it happened? You'd be told, hey, why are you fooling us? Because you don't even know what you're talking about. You confess what you know. And that's why the Bible says in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will you say that I'm calling on the name of the Lord and I've not even believed in him? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Have you seen you need to hear something? You hear the gospel and how shall they hear without a preacher? The same way Paul preached to us, he told us this is how you'll be saved by believing how Christ died for our sins and, all, uh, and so forth. So when you hear from a preacher, then now you get to understand. And of course, a preacher doesn't mean in church. It can be on YouTube. I got saved from YouTube. I got saved from watching videos on YouTube. And I was like, wow, this is so profound. I got to understand and hear the gospel and get to be saved. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Are you seeing there are people who send themselves? They are preaching a wrong doctrine, wrong message. And that's why people are never saved or they have a wrong conversion. Somebody thinks all his life that he's saved, but he's not even saved. Are you seeing the picture? Uh, and the Bible continues, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God is so happy with people who give the true gospel. He say, how beautiful are their legs, their feet as they are walking to go and tell people, or they are posting videos like this one online and telling people, this is how you're saved. How beautiful are their feet? You see why it's important to understand the gospel? Because if you don't understand the gospel, you'll be wrongly saved. You'll have a wrong con uh, conversion and you will go to hell you will not be raptured and you'll be asking, but I've always been in church. You are in the wide, the wide path of destruction. You are just in church. The way people are there because every Monday to, Monday to Friday, they are sinning, fornicating, lying, killing people, um, corrupt, doing all the evil things. But Sunday, they think because I go to church on Sunday, because I give tithes, because I, you are just in a wide path to hell. But the narrow way, it's by understanding the gospel is through the replacement thing. Jesus replaced you. He came at the cross where you're supposed to be so that you can come to where he's supposed to be. It's a replacement. Jesus replaced you. That is salvation. He just came here. He came at the cross. He died for your sins so that you can have his righteousness. That is exactly what the gospel is. And then after that, the Bible says in uh, Romans 10, verse 9, it says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart, you see, believing is key, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness. You see, it is with the heart that you believe. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, you're only confessing. The same way you go and meet a beautiful woman there and you you love her and you, you go and confess what you feel and tell her, hey, I want to marry you. So you don't go and tell her, I love you, I want to marry you. And then now you start loving them. No, it doesn't work the opposite. You first love them from your heart and then you go and tell them what you feel. That's exactly the picture of the gospel. Because if you just say it with your mouth, remember what Jesus said concerning the Pharisees? He said, these people... They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are away from me. Jesus does not want lip service. He wants you to believe from the heart. Are you seeing the picture? He wants you to believe from the heart after having understood. So you believe after you have understood, okay? Now, if talking with your mouth, with your lips is what saves you, then the deaf and the dumb people will go straight to hell because they can't speak. They can't mention words out then how will they be saved? Because they cannot speak. Are you seeing why salvation is from the heart? Because they, once they believe, the confession, you can even confess in your mind, Jesus, this is how I feel. Jesus, I know you died for my sins. You are buried and you rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And it is through your blood that I've gotten the redemption of sins. This, through this blood that I have the atonement, and I know and I believe and I trust. From today, Lord, I trust you. And I know 
I will not go to hell because I've trusted you. I've done what you've told me. So Jesus does not say, ask him for forgiveness. He already forgave you. He is asking you, trust in the forgiveness that he has given you. If you go and ask him, Jesus, please forgive me, forgive me. He'll just be wondering, but I already forgave you at the cross. I said it is finished. Why are you asking me? Why are you asking me about forgiveness? I already forgave you at the cross and I said it is finished. It is for you to just go and believe, accept, sign, and just say, I have accepted the forgiveness of sins. I now fully trust in you. And you only fully trust in it when you understand. A good example that I always like to give is, let's say, for example, your house is about to be locked. You have a, some rent arrears and you ask me, Keith, please help me. Please pay for me. My rent, my rent. I don't know what to do. And I tell you, it's okay. It's okay. I've heard you. I've already paid at the bank. Just go to the bank and sign and accept the payment. And then you keep on calling me, Keith, please. My house will be locked. Please, please. I'll ask you, why are you asking me to pay for you? I already did it. It's you who doesn't want to go to the bank and sign the paper and say, I have received the payment. Are you seeing the picture? So if you will not go to the bank and sign those papers, your house will be auctioned and you'll be thrown out and you will not blame me because already I paid. That is exactly with salvation. Jesus already paid for your sin at the cross. And you keep on telling me, Jesus, save me, save me, save me. He's told you, believe. Asking does not mean you'll be given. If I ask you, uh, please help me with 10,000. There are chances that you'll not give me because I have asked you, it doesn't mean you'll give me. But what if I've told you, uh, uh, you, you have told me that, Kate, there is 10,000 there on that seat. Go and pick it whenever you're ready. That one is an assure bet, is sure that if I go and pick it, it is mine because you already gave, it's me to go and pick. Salvation is something you just go and pick because it's not anything that you do, it's not anything that you ask. It is all about believing and you believe for your salvation. Repentance, what does the word repent mean? Repent does not mean stop sinning. It means change your mind, a change of mind. Because if repentance meant stop sinning, then Jesus is the biggest sinner. God is the biggest sinner, God the Father. Because in the Bible, actually in the Old Testament, we see over 32 verses where God repented. And God repented for having created man. And God repented from destroying Israel. And God repented from destroying Nineveh. And God repented. What was he repenting about? Was he a sinner? God was repenting, basically he was saying, he changed his mind from destroying Israel and he said no. He changed his mind from destroying Nineveh and he said, because they have prayed, I've heard their prayer and I've repented, I've changed my mind from what I was about to do to them. So repentance means change your mind from what you used to trust and now trust in Jesus Christ. You used to trust in your money, you used to trust in a, a prayer that you said, you used to trust in baptism, you used to trust in this and that, thinking this is what is saving you. The same way I used to trust in a prayer so much, I used to trust in giving to the church so much, I thought this is what is saving me. Until I repented and I changed my mind from trusting in this and trusting in the one Jesus Christ. That's the only time that I got to have salvation. And now I know and I know and I know 100% that I am saved and nothing can change me from that, all right? The Bible tells us in the book of Jude, okay? The book of Jude, uh, chapter one, verse 24. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with, exist with exceeding joy. So it is not you who keeps your salvation. God himself, he keeps your salvation. And he will present you that day blameless. You see, if you are the one who is keeping your salvation, then you will not even have it the next day because your thoughts are evil, things are evil, but the Holy Spirit is inside you. He's keeping your salvation and he will present you that day clean and blameless. That's why you can't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. All right. So it's, it's very important to understand the gospel that way. And now once you understand it that way, you will come out from a sense of not knowing if you're saved to knowing that you're fully saved. Because the Bible tells us in the book of John, 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, chapter 5, uh, verses what? Verse 13, he says this, these things I have written unto you. What things? The things in this Bible. 
of how you will be saved and all those things. Bible says, these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you see you can know that you have eternal life? But if you believe what God has said, this is how you're saved and you understand it and you believe it, now you know absolutely without any shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven. Have you seen? And that's what I understood and I believed it and I knew the Bible tells us that God is not a man that he would lie. God does not change his mind. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word remains. Remember what he said in the book of Matthew 24? The world will pass, but my words will never pass. So he promised us and he told us, if you believe that I died for your sins and I was buried and rose again, the third day according to the scriptures, how that I die, you understand, you'll not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. And that is how you know you're saved. I hope my testimony has been a blessing to you. It has been a blessing to you. Please, you can just comment there and you just say uh, probably one word, how, how it was. And if it has opened up your mind in some way or another, please also you can share the video. Share the video and let other people also be able to understand and uh, be able to know because you never know. The only person maybe you can share to can understand this and can be saved as well. And our goal and purpose is to have as many people saved before the rapture because the rapture is coming. It's coming very, very soon. Of course, I have so many other videos in my channel on my YouTube, Keith Mwoki, and also on my Facebook account. Uh, I usually use my just my normal Facebook account. My page, I use it once in a while. You can find me there. I always put a lot of videos. Please just go and view a couple of videos. They'll encourage you and uh, you'll be able to know more. If on your YouTube, okay, also please subscribe and also uh, so that you can always see different videos that I post. I post every, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 9 p.m. East African time. Okay, so you can always check us out. God bless you and be blessed. Have a good, good time.